Boker Tov, good morning, welcome everyone. Um, as you know, I'm speaking to a different cameras, several of them, so again in advance, I, I'm sorry if you see my eye going around. So good to see all of you and the, uh, this uh, form of uh, Zoom teaching hopefully soon will be over and we'll be able to meet each other in person. We zoom in the Parashat Shavua. The Torah portion is Naso, Book of Bamidbar. <clears throat> and the subject I would like to talk to you is the simple question of the length of this Parashat Naso. If you look at the length of the Parashat Naso, is the longest parasha for the entire Torah. And the topic or the subtopic I would like to talk to you is the connection, connection the correlation between the mitzvah of Kashrut, particularly Lot Vashel Gdi Bachalevimo, you should not cook a kid with its mother's milk, and the connection to Parashat Naso. What do I mean by that? The common question that all over my years, more than two decades in Rebunit, people ask is how come there is a redundancy? You see the names of the 12 tribes, the names of 12 leaders, each of them basically word by word, the same description, and you repeat it 12 times, which in a way impose on people hearing all of that. Can you say it just once and list all the names and that's it? Why you need to go for the specific of the name and the details what that uh, leader of the tribe did? So let's put this question aside for just a moment and jump to another question and soon, soon you see the correlation between the two. Common question in regard to Kashrut is what's the rationale? Not so much Kashrut at large, but particularly that mitzvah. If you look at the literal text, the Torah speaks about milk. You should not cook a milk with fleshik, with meat. Gdi bachalev imo. Chalev imo meaning the mother's milk the mother goat's milk, you cannot mix milk with a meat. If I ask you the question, what's the rational? I assume that you have those answers you remember from either years of uh, elementary school, Hebrew school, uh, even yeshiva's year. It's all good and well, but we're going today to a different dimension, uh, much deeper, much broader, and since we are talking here to a not only educated people, but uh, many of either active or retired teachers, I think this particular subject to you has a lot of applications. So in order to handle all those questions, we need to start with the foundation of something that we discuss many times, the structure of understanding of our Torah or our Tanakh and our teachings. And we learned in the past the concept called Pardes. Pardes is the four Hebrew letters that expresses four different avenues of understanding the text. One is the letter Pei, and Pei meaning Pshat, which is the simple understanding of the text. Then we have the reish, which is remez. Remez meaning a hint, a, something that alluded to the text. Then we have dalet. Dalet is the drash. Drash is a drush, rabbinical um, stories, rabbinic literature, mainly in the fourth century. And then we have samich. Thought, secret, esoteric, call it Kabbalah, whatever it is. Okay, so we are talking about four different avenues of understanding the text. Simple, literal, it's pshat. That's the way it's written. 
as our teachers used to tell us in Yiddish, Azei Schreiben. That's the way it's written. Do it, don't ask questions. The other one is the hint. You see all kind of understanding, juxtaposition, not understanding, from that you derive something much deeper. Then you have the Midrash. Midrash is a lot of stories in rabbinic writing. Sometimes we're so saturated with Midrash, between Midrash Rabbah, Midrash Sanchuma, and so many others, that we even sometimes mix the real text and the later rabbinic writing or rabbinic interpretation. So, the secret part of the Torah, we believe it starts mainly in the distribution of Rabbi Nechunia ben Akana, Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, the first, the second, the third century, and ex exposed to the world in much uh, bigger picture at the 11th, 12th century in uh, Provence and Girona, uh, Girona, and then at the 16th century by the Arizal, the well-known uh, Kabbalah and its teaching worldwide, um, from the Ashkenazic world with his students to the Marana Hidar, the Chaim David Azulai in Morocco. But the spread of secret understanding of Kabbalah. A little bit about Hasidim and Mitnagdim. We somehow heard this word Hasidim, but a little more than just knowing Hasidim and Misnagdim, in deeper understanding, Hasidim was phenomena that was post Shabtai Tzvi tobacco. Post Shabtai Tzvi tobacco was the era that um, Jewish people suffered greatly from a phenomena of false messiah. And at that time, it was a great need for answers. Why Jewish people suffering? Why there is so much persecution, particularly in Europe? So then it was the great rabbi, and in that sense we are speaking of the 17th century. He was named Rabbi Yisrael Baal Shem Tov, who is the founder of the Hasidic movement. And he came out with an unbelievable and beautiful and revolutionary idea. And the idea is, you're taking these pyramids and turn it upside down. What do I mean by that? So let's understand the mindset of the Baal Shem Tov. Again, it's a lot of legends, stories. The Baal Shem Tov, one time, the story goes that his disciples, his students, noticed he is very um, focusing, he's in a different planet, he's closing his eyes and it looks like he's not there. So when he finished praying, they stopped him and they said, Rabbi, what do you exactly do? What exactly transpired that long time? And he said, I was in the lower world. And they asked him, what do you mean lower world? Lower world, uh, it sounds like um, something not in your category, not in your level. To understand a little deeper, um, prior to Baal Shem Tov, Jewish world, if you read the Isaac Bashevitz singer, and other Yiddish literature, as well as the Hebrew early literature, from Shalom Aleichem to Shai Agnon and many others, you hear stories of the old shtetl, of the old village, when um, it was the Talmud Chochem, the Torah scholars, and others. Others have all kinds of names, can be derogatory, can be just a name, can be Balabat, can be Amaoretz, can be all kinds of names. But the key was you have those people who study Torah and study all day long and they hold as the uh, elite, as the highest, and there are others. In those years, back to the 15th, 16th, early 17th century, the wealth in the Jewish community doesn't carry much, for sure not the same as 21st century. It's a good example if you look at the literature of Bashevit Singer or Shai Agnon, 
you see a stories of a daughter of the rabbi, someone entertained, a shadch and a matchmaker, came out with the idea that the daughter of the rabbi um, should have a Talmud Chochem, a Torah scholar, and someone has the chutzpah, has the audacity to come with the idea to propose the daughter of the rabbi, the son of the wealthiest man in the, in the shtetl, in the village. And the rabbi was furious and everyone was furious even to think that way because who is this Amma Oretz, the, the son of someone who's unlearned person, to be with the elite, with the daughter of the rabbi? Don't even think that way, no matter how much money you have. And those stories you can read a lot in all those beautiful literatures. So up to that time, it was those Torah scholars that hold the elite, and that was the highest in the pyramids. And then it was Hiram, which is um, um, general people or general expression of other people, people who study sometimes, sometimes more, sometimes less. It can be half an hour between Minchamari, it can be a little more during the day, but not people who total occupy themselves in the study of Torah. The Baal Shem Tov came in, and as we said, he turned the pyramids upside down. And when he opened his eyes, he said to his disciples, I was in the Olamot Tachtonim, in the lower world. And they asked him, what do you mean by that? And he said, I saw the Messiah. I saw the Mashiach. So they asked him, what do you mean you saw the Messiah? He said, the Mashiach, the Messiah, is in the lower world. They asked him, what do you mean? And he expanded on the idea that is in nowadays, in the modern days, it's called Nusach Sfard. So again, we need to understand another concept, which is among the Ashkenazi community, there are two different avenues of Sidurim, of prayer books. One is Nusach Ashkenaz, the, either the Lithuanians or others, the Litvaks, they use the Nusach that many of congregations use. There is another one that's nothing to do with the Sephardim, something different, that is called Sfard. The letters are the same, the meaning is totally different. Sephard is the opposite, the reverse word of the Pardes. Do you remember earlier we said that there are four avenues of understanding the Torah? Pshat, simple, hint, remez, midrash, drush, and secret, the soul. The Baal Shem Tov came in and he said, turn the pyramid the other way around. Start with the secret, give it to the masses, and then you go and teach them other things. It was a strong opposition, it's called the Misnagdi strong opposition to that idea because what the Baal Shem Tov tried to say is all these elites of scholars that occupy themselves all day with the Torah they are wonderful and great but they need to do that with everyone which means everyone can do everything and everyone has the potential to be the highest of the elites so when they ask him what do you saw and what do you mean by saying you see the messiah he said i saw shabtai tzvi now we all know as the student asked him shabtai tzvi is the worst false messiah it was total wrong charlatans horrible someone that so many tens of thousands follow and it was total wrong he ends up by converting to islam it's not it's not something that any means of spirit of Judaism or Jewish uh, hope. And he explained to them so beautifully and he said, yes, he was the kind of potential to be the Redeemer, but what happened is it's a tragedy that um, he caused, which is the moment he, meaning Shabtai Tzvi, entertained the idea of narcissism, that it's all about him, he causes not only a destruction and, and cancer and damage to himself, but to the entire world. Meaning, throughout generation, from 
the Frankist to other movements have all kind of a person that everyone thinks that that person is the Messiah, he is the... Yes, many of them were great leaders. Even Moses was a great leader. We do not know where he was buried. One of the reasons is not to worship his gravesite. The key idea is there is a need to turn the pyramid about Shem Tov said and have the accessibility of that information that was totally classified earlier to the public. Meaning, every generation has the potential to have someone to come out and help them and redeem in that sense. But as long as it's not entered to his personal ego, personal narcissism, and it's only about me, then um, uh, it will be okay. He called it in a beautiful Hebrew language, Tohar HaKavanot. Tohar Kavanot in the IDF and many other um, democratic armed forces, they said, Tohar HaNeshek, when you're using a ammunition, you have to take a vow to commit yourself that you use it solely for defense purposes. When it's come to Tohar HaKavanot, before you're doing something so crucial to other people, such as educating people, you have to be a good leader, a good trainer to declare your intent. And the intent has to be, unlike Shabtai Tzvi, has to be a total pure intent. Um, uh, it's a famous statement from the late uh, Israeli uh, president, Shimon Peres. I'm sure that some of you have the privilege to either know him or heard about him. He said, the greatest of a person, I tried to translate it from the Hebrew, the greatest of the person is the, the, great, the greatest the idea that the person is ready and willing to serve that demonstrates the greatest of the person, which means um, a person needs to make a declaration of his or her intent and then he needs to follow. So it means it's okay for a person to, for example, in our discussion, wants to eat something and need to support his um, body. But with that said, it has to be also the, the um, need of sharing with others, need of um, idealism. So individualism is, in Judaism is okay, as long as it's combined with an ideal. Now, in that sense, we um, need to enter that question, which is why in the world our Torah, which we believe is the blueprint of life, tells us do not mix mother's milk or milk of mother animal with meat. So obviously, as we said, there are some rabbis who give them the highest respect, have ideas and interpretations. But if you go by the esoteric, the secret Torah Sod, the way that the Baal Shem Tov and his disciples teaches the world, is something that is in a way concealed up to that point. And because, as we said, the fear that the teaching of Shabtai Tzvi and others can lead people to misconstrue what Judaism is all about, that was the misnagdim, that was the fear, that was the harem, the, the ban, the, the asceticism that they put against people who teach it. But what the Baal Shem Tov and his students said about it, they said that the law of kashrut, or for our discussion, the law of a prohibition against milk, mixing milk with meat, it's because they are a spiritual existent in the universe, cosmic um, uh, reality in the universe that um, involve in that context with nothing to do with food. Uh, is speaking about two separate of energies. So if those of you write notes, we are speaking about two avenues of two separate energies. Energy number one is the energy that you receive only for yourself. The, that energy is called in Ivri Tsinor Satum, which means you have a pipe, but the pipe is basically black. Is only one way. So when you see an animal 
eating other animal or eating any form of meat is basically a short period of time of meat consuming meat for the purpose of selfish needs for meat and that's it so the the language is that our clock our way of life is so brief is so transient is so short that is no difference between human and animals it's just for short time and time is always the winner so if you take the meat and the time the animal was born the clock is clicking is the hour and it's two hours and it's two days and two years and 10 years and 15 years and it's over so in that sense the pipe is clock is just one way of receiving the energy there is another one that is the pipe that transmitting something to other source which means there is a, a recipient there is a giver there is a recipient but the recipient is nothing to do with the recipient itself the recipient transmitted to other source of need so when we speak about um, two avenue of cosmic energy we talk about um, it's called in physics Torata Kvantin which means in physics they are speaking about um, a correlation between the energy in the universe and the actions of uh, creatures or people in the world in that sense it's really the same as the teaching in China of Taoism and Confucianism dealing with the yin and yang and the male and female idea of giver and receiver so any entity in our world the Baal Shem Tov and his students said any living entity no matter if it's a human animal or anyone this is the materialistic part that it's only for that person himself now because the structure of that energy is to just receive it for himself so then guess what's going to happen that hour that clock will be tickling and tickling and therefore eventually the hourglass will be it, it, it will be over we know that everything has a beginning and short end the time is basically the hourglass break it sooner or later now if you take animal you know in advance they're going to leave seven days seven weeks seven months 17 years and that's it a person we have a structure of life we know that as we learn 120 about the life now what happened when you take an animal let's use something i know some of you are vegan i'm just using it as a, a springboard as a illustration someone takes an animal and um, slaughter the animal and then even with all the cashless laws and eats it now he or she represent something which is something that they are doing if you think deeply to you can call it for their body needs you can talk, call it protein you can call it all kind of names but it's something that in that sense can be total selfish just for their maintenance for their life what exactly if you analyze what happened to milk milk created an opposite energy meaning the energy of the mother's milk is the the pipe which means the mother is now called to give to her baby can be human can be animal her own milk she have this energy this strength and she utilize herself to give milk to others so if you put these two entities together and you try to compare the Torah said that is a spiritual damage you cause by mixing the two entities meaning you have the entity of um, energy of milk which is a pipe that receive and call to right away gives if it's stuck with the mother it can be clock it has to give be given and there is energy of meat that is just for yourself now let's go to the next level what happened if you take meat 
product and you leave it. It can survive if it's refrigerated for a certain time, but eventually, sooner or later, it will be a rotten meat, you need to throw it away. Sometimes even animals cannot touch it, right? Yes, there are some tricks with some unnatural way, but in a regular way, meat have a lifespan of very short time. Um, versus when we speak about French cheese, for example, you take cheese that is very expensive, which is a milk that turned to be cheese, and the longest you hold it, the highest quality of that milk. What we understand that those center of energy applies also the way that the creator created us as, as um, a human. He created us in um, central of body that it's a the emotional part, the spiritual part, and that center in our simple language has a fuse, a, a, a all kind of electrical part that have a response to everything that happens to us. And therefore, you have two separate energies, each of them leading to the opposite direction. The energy of milk leading to kiyum, to hemshechiyut, meaning to a continuation of life. From the mother, let's say the goat mother, the cow mother, or the natural uh, human mother, to its baby. It's an er energy of milk that come and transform to another life, to give life to a baby that cannot live without the, the uh, food and the support of the mother. There is the opposite energy of death, which is the energy that just the meat itself. Therefore, the Baal Shem Tov explained, when we are dealing with the Tohara Kavanot, the purity of our mind, of our intent, a person should always evaluate his or her serious intent before they are doing something. What exactly I am doing that is just generate something to me or to my narcissistic needs and what I am really receiving from the highest being in order to transform that milk, to transform that teaching, transform that knowledge to others. The difference in that teaching is the energy of life and the energy of death. And that's the way we started the Pilke Avot, the ethics. The ethics teaches us at the very beginning, Moshe, Moses, Kibel Torah Misinai. Moses received the teaching and right away, it's not for himself, it's not for his diploma, Um Sarah Yoshua, he right away transmitted to his disciple Joshua, and Joshua to the prophet, and the prophet to the elder, and the elder to the man of great assembly, which is a pipe of their life, giving life from one source to another source, and it's only the pipe. So we don't know where Moses was buried, because it's not Moses as Moses, is just a pipe that transmits something from one entity to another. The energy at Kiyum, the energy of living, is energy that receiving in order to give life to someone else. The energy of death is the energy that all I'm doing is only for myself. The individualism is something that can be admired if the purpose, the Torah Kavanot, the general intent is out there to receive and to learn in order for me to give. If a person, in that sense, the Baal Shem Tov explained, be a pipe that is only about him or her, it will be clogged. You know what happened to the sewer when it's clogged? Then it's very bad and can have a bad odor. The law of Kashrut, in that sense, explain to us, and I'm using just as an explanation, two separate movies that I'm sure um, you're familiar with them. One is called Stand and Deliver. This is a well-known movie, I'm sure um, you uh, know about or watch this movie uh, from 1988. Um, Stand and Deliver, uh, I'm just reading the, the really short synopsis, uh, it tells the story of a high school a mathematics teacher who takes a class of losers 
and potential dropouts and transform them in the course of the one school year he take those kids who have learned so much that 18 of them are able to pass a tough college credit uh, exam the exam is so hard that only two percent of students nationwide um, can pass it although everyone in the class does so the story is based on fact on the life of a uh, jamie i hope i said the right name as skeleton um, and uh, east los angeles man who um, left a higher paying job in business to return to education and prove something what he proved is that motivation and hard work can rewrite the destinies of kids that society might be willing to write off so this is one factor of energy one movie that speaks about what exactly a teacher a leader does with the, his capability and his or her potential there is the opposite movie in that sense that i would like to share with you and i'm again sure that many of you if not all of you watch it it's called the wave and that movie is from 1981 just nod your head if you hear it okay the wave and the wave is based on a true story the wave was a man for tv movie wearing Miss, mr ross a high school history teacher he conducts a social experiment where students learn how easy it is to be seduced by the same social forces which led to the honor of nazi germany high school social studies teacher ben ross showed his class a film about the holocaust when the students question how the german people could have allowed such a thing to occur ross finds himself unable to answer their question so instead he begins a classroom experiment to demonstrate the dangers of discipline community and fascism and the experiment begins simply with ross demonstrating how proper posture and simple rules create greater classroom efficiency the students follow the new rules so enthusiastically that ross carries on the experiments the following day by introducing the wave which he claimed is a youth movement students are issued membership cards taught a secret wave uh, salute and are given special duties robert an unpopular student is assigned the role of a monitor over the other students which fills him with pride and only at the very end of the movie the student realize that the teacher tried to teach them what does that mean nazi germany and why things happen so what you see in these two opposite movies between the share and deliver to the the way the two different energy two different status that can be either very beneficial or very destructive as you see the first one if you are very careful you will be not just a wonderful example and leader by standing and deliver you can be a role model that others will follow if you are not careful you can be the leader of the wave of that movie that uh, um, everyone has a potential to be nazi to be nazi can be the two opposites and back to the issue of the ego when a person reach this um, uh, level it can be in his mind such a level that all the tohar kavanot all the intent from where you're coming from it's all about yourself versus it's all about giving so it's all begin and end with idealism one of the things that happens to some of the world leaders since the earliest time is when someone turned to be quote-unquote guru not necessarily guru in india obviously but a, a influential leader 
uh, even if we talk about the small scale, and again, I'm talking here to people who have their life dedicated to education. So when you talk about students, the students recognize right away how serious and how far you are ready to fight for them or care for them. They are teacher and they are teacher. If you tell your students, here is my phone, whenever you need me, call me anytime, if they feel a great love, if they feel that you are there for them, then they trust you and then you bring heaven to earth for them because what happened to those students, they, some of them come with no hope and you are in a way the Mashiach, you are the way, the one who gives them all the hope. So, in a sense, you give the, 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 the self-image, the strength, the belief that it's all dependent on you and you can be everything, and that's the dissonance that, that happened. If you get it and transfer it and do it right, then you have a chance to have this great success. If it's all about you, it can be clogged. Now, with that um, uh, sense, the rabbis ask a simple question. What happened to a person when he or she does a mitzvah? I give you just a, again, example from a very close friend of mine. He came from a very large family in Jerusalem, a very, very, very poor family. And years passed by, he had the privilege to go to university and eventually he find himself with another friend in Paris. So while walking on the street, they saw a gypsy's mother, homeless, with her daughter in the street. So my friend, he pulled out 100 franc, which is a lot of money, and he gave it to the gypsies. So the other guy said to him, are you crazy? You know how much money you gave her? So he said to him, listen, I came 30 years ago from very, very poor family. I know the feeling of homeless mother who's sitting in the street in this weather with her daughter here in Paris. So I feel for her. Why I'm saying that? This is an example of what the Baal Shem Tov and the rabbis try to teach us. When someone does a mitzvah, the question is, what's the motivation? What's the kavana? What is the purity of the intent? It's not a bad intent, but there are different categories, different levels. When someone attends the funeral, do you attend the funeral because people recognize you? Because you just um, hope that someone will see your face there? Or you're not only sure that no one recognizes you, you even disguise yourself so no one definitely recognizes you or know about you. That's a different level when you're doing a mitzvah. And why we're we saying that? Because the Midrash tells us the 12 tribes, the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes, I'm sure that you know and remember that Midrash. Um, it was the water at the front of them. It was the Egyptians on the back. It was a great man by the name of Nachshon, son of Aminadab. He saw the water without thinking twice. God told us he jumped to the water and 11 men followed him. And the Midrash said that they reached their neck level when all of a sudden it was splitting of the sea and miracle happens and all their followers follow them. And from that beautiful Midrash, the derivative is that they are rewarded, um, as the Torah mentioned in this parasha, by being the 12 presidents of the 12 tribes, the 12 brave leaders of 12 tribes. And to honor each and every one of them for his tremendous uh, bravery and, and, and guts and sincerity, they give the separate recognition to each and every one of them because each and every one was ready and willing to give his life for the people because that's what Hashem asked him, what the Almighty asked him, he's jumping to the water. Whatever happened, happens, that's the call, that's what I'm doing. They don't expect miracle to happen, they just did because that's what they asked to do. They are really dedicate themselves for others. That level of devotion creates that energy. Now we understand What's the real difference uh, the Baal Shem Tov tried to teach by revealing the sword, the secret? He's telling us that when it's come to energy of mixing milk and meat, 
Each energy represents something opposite, something different. And when it's come to our own personal life, the derivatives, no matter who you are and what you are, you have to ask yourself before doing something, I'm doing that for just for myself, for my um, self-gratification of my self-needs or recognition, or I'm doing that to be a pipe that the Almighty, the Creator, use in order to transmit light and goodness to others. So, now we understand why it's a long parsha, the longest in the Torah. We understand why we need to give each and every leader of the tribe his own recognition. But we also understand the special uh, teaching of the mitzvah, thou shall not mix a kid with its mother's milk. Hopefully, this type of teaching brings you not only a positive energy, but also understanding that there is a different angle, different level of and knowing our beautiful Torah and teaching with others and to see why so many other faith groups have the, the core and derivative from our own beauty of uh, our blueprint of life, our Torah. This time, anyone want to ask me a question, please do so. Anna bechoach gedulat yeminecha tatir tzerura Anna bechoach gedulat yeminecha tatir tzerura